Good evening. Thanks for joining us on India Business Hour. I'm Shireen Bhan. The top story this evening, a sharp volatility that we've been seeing in crude oil. Prices declining in early trade, but they are now trading absolutely flat with Brent up one-tenth of a percent. And the NYMEX almost unchanged at 71.74. Now, this follows a surge in U.S. shale output as well as rising U.S. inventories. The block of oil producing nations, that's the OPEC, has welcomed the additional output from the United States. In an exclusive conversation with CNBC TV 18, OPEC Secretary General Mohammad Barkindo says the supply from the U.S. has helped prevent, and I quote him, an unprecedented global crisis. Right from inception of the shale revolution in the United States, we openly and officially welcomed these timely and additional volumes of crude and liquids that came into the market from the basins of the United States. Without those volumes, the world would have sunk into an unprecedented crisis. If you recall, then we had lost production from some of our major producers and exporters. Demand will continue to grow by about 14.5 million barrels a day up up to 2014 the bulk the mm. bulk of this mm. growth mm. the bulk of this growth will be coming from india uh, uh, significantly mm. therefore it is in our interest as producers to ensure that this healthy growth in india and other consuming countries is protected well, that's the OPEC Secretary General saying that the U.S. shale output has helped prevent an unprecedented crisis on account of high crude prices. But the other big influential voice that we've spoken to, the vice chairman of IHS market, Daniel Jurgen, expects the uncertainty around crude prices to increase around the 4th of November. And that's because that is the day when the second round of U.S. sanctions against oil supplies from Iran kick in. In an exclusive with CNBC TV 18, Jurgen also says he expects crude oil prices to hover at around $85 per barrel in the next quarter. Today at 80, but the expectation is that we'll trade within that 80 to 85 range. Take a look. Unless something really unexpected happens in the world, I think the maximum period of sort of uncertainty and, and high prices will be uh, as we go into the end of this year and mm. early next year. I think, you know, we show prices in the, in the fourth quarter in a kind of orbit around uh, 80, $85, maybe a little lower if we start to see slower demand. I think, you know, I think the, you know, we're now uh, in mid-October and I think next couple of months will be tight and there will be uncertainty and there will be a lot of volatility as we get close to that November 4th date. It's a big issue for India, but it's a big issue for, uh, for the whole global market. Global market. We see starting in September of 2019 to March of 2020, we see a lot of additional oil coming from the United States. It's all backed up right now. And so I think if the market has that in, its, in mind, it's, you know, because the markets work on expectations, that will be a factor even earlier in 2019. Well, that's Daniel Jurgen. Even as global crude oil prices ease, there is no relief at the petrol pump back home. Prices have started to move higher. Again, petrol in Mumbai costs over 88 rupees a litre and diesel is inching closer to the 80 rupee mark. With this hike that came in today, the government's 2 rupee 50 pesa fuel price cut has been reversed in the last 15 days. Diesel in Chennai now costs over 80 rupees and prices have also risen in Kolkata, Delhi and most other major cities. Well, that's the fuel price action onto the Lal Street where the bulls continue to gain lost ground, largely thanks to softer crude oil prices as well as a strengthening rupee. After a strong start, the Nifty faced resistance at 10,600, but the index still managed to end with gains of 70 points. Sensex rallied about 300 points, reclaiming 35,000. The Bank Nifty ended with gains of 200 points while the mid caps continued their up move with the mid cap index putting on more than one and a half percent reclaiming 17,000 and the rupee today also strengthening the Indian currency ending the day at 73.46 hitting its highest level against the dollar since the 3rd of October so that bodes well 
for the markets. The big earnings today, Infosys reporting its second quarter earnings, the company's revenue and net profit both topping street estimates. However, there's been a miss on the margins, even as it secured large deals worth over $2 billion during the last quarter. Kritika Saxena joins us now from the Infosys headquarters in Bengaluru uh, with the key takeaways. Kritika. All in all, a good set of numbers by Infosys. Constant currency revenue growth at 4.2 percent. Uh, dollar revenue, rupee revenue, all have beaten now what we were expecting. But if you really had to nitpick, margins have come in at 23.7 percent versus our expectation of 24.3 percent. Now here's why: the management did uh, say that uh, the priority was to reinvest back into the business. So while yes, rupee depreciation has uh, seen a positive impact of 80 basis points, uh, uh, the pricing and lower on-site mix has benefited margins by 70 basis points, but they reinvested back in uh, reskilling employees, in variable pay, in compensation to a restitution, and that's hit margins by 100 basis points. Add to that, uh, higher subcontracting expenses and localization has hit margins by 50 basis points. So it's flat over there. That, uh, that trend of reinvesting back into the business may continue. But if you look at the FI19 guidance, they have retained uh, it at 6 to 9% uh, in constant currency terms for revenue. For margins, uh, it's been retained at uh, 20 22 to 24 percent you could again nitpick that why haven't they uh, increased their guidance if the momentum is good if the internals is good management says that the demand continues to remain positive and they are actually seeing that in numbers so digital revenue has gone up by 13.5 percent core however uh, the core business is up by just about 0.5 percent and that seems to be the way this trend is moving large deal wins is the big positive here two billion dollars in this quarter versus 1.1 billion dollar last quarter three coming in from BFSI and that's shown in the internals. BFSI growth of 5.8%, retail 5.9%, North America 3.8%, Europe 4%. So internals are strong. Infosys after a very long time seems to be confident despite the CFO now moving on from the company. Infi seems to be confident. Aside from little concerns over attrition, the deal pipeline is positive for the company and they are in a position to be able to grab the opportunity uh, that is there across even volatile markets like North America. We see a strong demand outlook, as I shared. We see good fundamentals uh, in the U.S. market. We see a good macro. We see strong macro in the continental European market. Uh, our deal wins are strong in Q2. We're also strong in Q1. Uh, all in all, uh, our view is uh, that this is a fairly comfortable uh, outlook in terms of demand and revenue growth for us. Uh, so we remain quite comfortable with uh, where our revenue is looking today. Rupee benefited us by about 80 basis points, mm. and we also had a good pricing as well as uh, some of the uh, seven, another 70 basis points came to us. But that entire 150, we invested about 100 basis points for new additional compensation mm. and also to address certain uh, pockets of attrition that we mm. had. You know, the currency movement is also another factor. How is it going to play out? It has been extremely volatile, yeah. if you look at the last uh, one week at least. Mm. So at this point in time, we are comfortable with uh, the guidance. Mm. And we are pretty much, if you look at the first mm. half of the year, pretty much at so the top end of the guidance. So watch out for the stock when our markets open for trade tomorrow. Now, shares of cable TV providers, Hathaway Cable and uh, Den Network, were higher today. This after sources told CNBC TV 18 that Reliance Industries plans to buy a controlling stake in both these companies. Announcement of deal is expected tomorrow. Nisha has been tracking that story. Joins us now with more details. So Nisha, tell us how these deals add value to Geo's arsenal. The cable TV sector has been itching for consolidation and Reliance Industries with its REL Geo is the new entrant which is acting as a consolidator. Sources with direct knowledge share with us that Reliance Industries could be announcing the buyout of both Den Networks as well as Hathaway Cable along with its results on October 17th and um, the structure will be such that first it will be a controlling stake buyout into the company through fresh equity issuance which will then trigger an open offer. So Reliance Industries could land up owning over 70% stake in both Den and Hathaway. It is likely to be around the current market price and may not have much of a premium to it is what we gather. As far as impact is concerned, Reliance Geo will gain in two ways. First, the subscriber base access to 20 billion subscribers. On the other hand, the last mile connectivity is also extremely critical, which comes with Den as well as Hathaway, who have a right of way. Also remember that their subscriber base are premium 
subscribers and therefore the ARPUs will also improve. But one thing to remember is that most of the subscribers are on video TV basis and not high speed broadband and that's the area which Reliance Geo will look at really beefing up. So that will be gradual, will need a technological change from the present technology that these companies use and also by integrating the service offering to their uh, various uh, consumers as well. But nonetheless, it is going to beef up their overall portfolio and the larger base and this is going to turn on the heat on the competitors like Airtel, Tata Sky as well as Dish TV. All right, Nisha, appreciate you joining us. So expect that uh, deal announcement tomorrow. That's what we're given to understand. Let's now move to the latest in the Me Too movement. Another journalist has now accused Union Minister M.J. Akbar of sexual misconduct and assault. Tushita Patel is the 16th woman to level charges against Akbar, even as the government remains silent. In fact, news just coming in, and this is being broken by our, our sister uh, digital site first post saying that 17 women from the Asian age have decided to speak out and have asked the court to hear their stories. 17 women journalists who were part of the first few teams of, uh, M of Asian age uh, the, that was set up by MJ Akbar when it was launched in 1994 have written a petition describing the former editor's behavior, condemning his sexual advances and asking the court to hear the defamation, that's hearing the defamation case, which is the Patala High Court, to consider their testimony about the culture of casual misogyny, entitlement, and sexual predation that he engendered and presided over. So this is a petition that's been signed by 17 journalists who were part of the Asian Age. Let's go across now to Parikshit Lutra. He's joined by a panel of guests to take on this raging controversy. A Delhi court will be hearing the defamation case filed by Minister M.J. Akbar on the 18th of October. But that has not stopped more journalists from speaking out. Now, a 16th journalist, Tushita Patel, has spoken out. She has accused M.J. Akbar of sexual harassment when she was working with The Telegraph in 1992. Tushita says, and I quote, There are other victims who you almost broke with your lust and power trip and more will speak out. But today, we will also take this debate beyond newsrooms, ladies and gentlemen. More than 580 cases of sexual harassment were reported in India's top companies, including 244 from India's IT companies. We're also getting your findings of a YouGov first post survey, which shows high rates of sexual harassment at the workplace. Joining us to take this discussion forward, senior Supreme Court lawyer and Rajya Sabha MP KTS Tulsi, senior journalist Nija Chaudhary, social activist Yogita Bhayana, general manager of YouGov India, Deepa Bhatia, and professor at Columbia University, Raju Narasetti. Thank you for joining us. Raju Narasetti, coming first to you, despite mounting allegations. Today, a 16th journalist, Tushita Patel, has spoken out, but we haven't heard a word from the government. What is the message that really goes out to the international community? Well, less about the international community. Think of the message that goes out to all the women in India, including in media, that the government is staying silent on an issue where so many women have come out with very specific allegations, while the response from Mr. Akbar has been just a blanket denial, calling it frivolous and at the same time calling it defamatory. So it's troubling that there has not been a response, and I think it kind of sends a pretty chilling signal that the government really doesn't care or has other reasons to stay silent, and that's really unfortunate. Right. Neil Chaudhary, getting you in at this point, do you think, do you think this defamation case is going to stop women from speaking out? Yesterday, this defamation case was filed. Today, Tushita spoke out. And she, and she in a way, warned MJ Akbar, saying, enough of legal intimidation. More women will come out in the days to come. There are many whom you've broken and destroyed with your lust and power trip. I don't expect it to die down very easily. I think it's going to escalate. It is like the eruption of a volcano which is waiting to burst. And uh, given the consciousness that has grown amongst women about their rights, about gender justice, and about against uh, intimidation, sexual intimidation at workplace. So I think, uh, you know, politically the response has been very disappointing from the government. Instead of uh, asking Mr. M.G. Akbar to step down, pending an inquiry, he could have been reinstated if nothing was found out against him. Instead, it is, you know, distant itself 
from Mr. Akbar, but allow him in, allowing him to continue as minister, which gives him an, an advantage when he fights a case or slaps on a case against one of the complainants of defamation. So I think it becomes a very uh, uneven playing field. And, uh, but that apart, women are so angry and so enraged, you know, at what has been going on and they have been si silent mm. for so long. You know, the new thing that's happened is that that silence has been broken right. about sexual harassment. And that is going to embolden a, lo a lot of women right. to come out with what is actually has been an outpouring of what has been happening to them. You know, Manisha Priyam, Raju Narasetti and uh, Nija Chaudhary have raised an important point. The silence of the BJP, the silence of the government, what kind of a message does it send out to women across the country? Is this going to come and hurt the BJP at some point? Because over here, you've got so many women speaking out on a day-to-day -day basis, but the government just doesn't speak on MJ Akbar. He continues with his foreign tours. It seems the government is firmly backing him. And the response is that whatever happened so did not happen message, during his tenure as minister. The message that is coming out from women, clearly let it be communicated through the channel to Mr. M.J. Akbar and the government of which he is a minister is of horror. I saw a visual the day he landed that the might of the Indian state, armed guards of the Indian state mm. had, you know, you can still see it by your side. They have guns with them and they are protecting Akbar. At this point of time, who needs greater protection? Remember, the state is a concept in the abstract. The state of which Mr. Akbar is a minister is a concept in mm. the abstract. The state needs to protect its weakest. The armed might of the state needs to protect hapless poor women who are at the receiving end of Mr. Akbar's plucking strings. So uh, clearly, and, and also the fact that, you know, being a minister is not a matter of privilege or right for Mr. Akbar. This is being a minister of a parliamentary mm. democracy, a, a government which is constituted by the people who are the sovereign of India every five years. They rump the whole thing. They recreate the sovereign. So what is the power that Mr. So Akbar is mm. showing back to the women, hapless women who have complained, is something that is not understandable by me. At mm. this point of time, he needs to step down while the, right. uh, you know, the, the cases are going on. Remember, what are the mm. complaints that are coming? The mm. complaints are clearly saying that sexual right. harassment needs to be not just seen as the act, but extended to understand that if you stare at mm. me, if you glare at me, if mm. you look at my undergarments, and you know, it is very embarrassing for me. And let me conclude by telling you that the piece of clothing that women are mm. talking about where they have been, you know, violated is a mm. piece of clothing that has come to Indian women mm. through the might of the Indian national movement. These clothing have come to us by Ravindra Tagore, right. setting out the kind of clothes that women of India can wear. Mm. So if we stand today responsibly as women mm. wearing the clothes we do in our persona, mm. conducting ourselves to the mm. best that we can and let the might and persona of the Indian woman constituted in continuity through the struggles of the Indian national movement, communicate mm. through your channel to Mr. M.G. Akbar that he needs to step mm. down today. He needs to step down. Manisha Priyam, very clear, saying that this man needs to step down. But just imagine, this is a government which has been talking about Beti Pachao, Beti Padao. They've spoken about women's safety, women empowerment, triple talaq. But if you remain silent on such an issue, you don't ask M.G. Akbar to go, then what does it show about you? Why is the BJP, why is the government reluctant to call out M.G. Akbar, ask him to step aside till an inquiry is over. This is a very big revolution and we really want, uh, you know, or more women to come out and uh, to our surprise, a lot of women are gathering courage to come out and talking. But if Mr. M.G. Akbar, you know, he doesn't really uh, come with the higher, higher moral grounds and does not resign, I think we don't see any hope for the other cases because this is intimidating mm. the women by hiring, uh, the, these women by hiring 97 lawyers, not stepping down, saying that I do whatever you can mm. do, I am not... I'm not hurt or I'm not, uh, you know, uh, I'm untouchable and nothing will go wrong with me. I'm still there as a cabinet minister. Right. Who the hell are you to, you know, tell me? So what kind of example are we setting him? This case is very important because it is not uh, one woman versus MJ Akbar. It is about 
14 women, more than 14 now, versus cabinet ministry of government of India. The whole BJP we are talking about. KTS Tulsi, MJ Akbar has filed a defamation case yeah. against only one journalist, Priya Ramani. There are at least 16 other journalists who have spoken out, other women who have spoken out. Why not cases against them? What does this show? Well, I don't know. He may... He, you see, lawyers uh, craft their strategy. Um, firstly, I would like to congratulate uh, the women of India. The dime has broken and the movement is an instant success. It hasn't even gone to the smaller cities as yet. And when it does, it will shake the earth even more. Um, but I want to say that our experience in Indian courts is that people hardly ever tell the truth. It's a courtroom, a courtroom as if it, there's a license to tell lies. He's a public representative. He's a member of the Rajya Sabha. He's a minister of state in the government. He travels abroad on official visits. Can he continue in office while these allegations are being made against him on a daily basis? Can it all be called a conspiracy? You see, uh, I can tell you that he has already lost the moral authority to continue. It's just that if the party uh, uh, plays hardball and doesn't care to hoots about the sentiment of the nation, the sense of the nation, then what can anybody do except that they will only be taught a lesson at the hustings, which are not too far. But the point oh. is, there is very thin line which divides consent with coercion. Mm. And it's that thin line of which people take advantage, not only in these cases, but in all cases of sexual assaults. Mm. People try to turn this into a consensual activity. Deepa, if I can get you in, you surveyed about 750 respondents. What did your survey really show? Do women feel safe? Do they feel okay with complaining to the HR if they face sexual harassment as work? at work? So yes, we did actually survey 759 women across, of working women across India. And uh, what was interesting was that almost 27% of them said that they were aware of some, some kind of sexual harassment case happening in their own, in the present current organization. But only 16% actually admitted to having suffered it themselves. Um, and what was even more interesting is that though there's high awareness with them, uh, almost two-thirds of them know that their workplaces have policies in place to safeguard them. Um, but when they do suffer any kind of case of sexual harassment, they don't choose to reach out to HR first, but choose to go to their informal network, to friends and colleagues, um, family and spouses after that. And only after um, HR comes in just in the eighth place at the moment. Do you feel that their colleagues, their senior colleagues and editors, have backed them enough? Do you think more senior people in the media industry need to come out and back these journalists who are showing the courage to speak out? Absolutely. And I think Priya Ramani, who was the first one to really name uh, Mr. Akbar, has said so publicly that uh, more editors uh, who know her haven't really spoken up. You're seeing a few more people step up, a few more articles, uh, shows like uh, your own show now, that are focusing on this issue, this issue. I want to make two points, though, about the earlier debate we are having. By making this all about whether he should resign or not, we are actually falling into the kind of the trap that he is setting, right? Which is to say, this is all about politics. I think there, that's an important issue um, to raise. But I think more importantly, we should also be asking about the kind of culture in those media organizations, which had ownership, which had other staff, other leaders, which enabled him to do allegedly all the acts that he has done, I think it's worth talking about what was the culture, who is accountable for that more than this individual himself, and raise broader questions about what is the culture, what is the recourse women might have in newsrooms across India. And this is not just an India issue. This has become a major issue in the U.S. But the mm. focus in the U.S. in the last year since the Me Too movement has been to put the pressure on individual news organizations, whether they're TV stations or big newsrooms, to say, what are your new policies? What is changing? 
and in some cases to create a fund mm. to help mm. uh, defending these women and fight cases. There has to be due process, as some of our guests have mm. said today. Um, you know, Bill Cosby took a second trial mm. before he was convicted. Uh, Harvey Weinstein is still going through the court process. Mm. But independent of that, we ought to provide right. enough structures for women journalists in India to speak up and feel safe about it. Very important. Very important. Nija Chaudhary, do you feel that we're all culpable by our silence? When we talk about these 17 journalists, when we talk about Priya Ramani or Atushita Patel, the organizations they, they worked at, the peers, their colleagues, and other senior editors who worked with MJ Akbar, we're all culpable in a way, culpable by our silence. Yeah, I think we are all culpable if we are silent. Absolutely true. That it, you know that these women have had to suffer what they're now talking about. You know the indignity of it, and we we still are not. You know what is going to lead to revulsion after so much has come out? When are we going to get really angry that enough is enough? And uh, he's right. You know, uh, create a fund. I would even, as I've done in the last two days, I would appeal to the Chief Justice of India to convert their testimonies into a public interest litigation and to hear it expeditiously. Manisha Priyam, we just got some statistics from YouGov First Post survey that only 27% of the respondents surveyed actually complained to the HR. Most of them just wanted to go to their friends, family members or an informal network. Do you think this is something that we really need to think about? Yes, of course, what you say is correct. Second, let me bring in one element of the debate which is specifically Indian. Remember, this is a global movement which is coming into India. But where Raju comes from, he's talking about Cosby or he's talking about Weinstein. <clears throat> you need to understand that the American judicial system and the Indian judicial system or jurisprudence, so to say, are differently placed. In the U.S., if, you, if the women made the complaint as they have made, whether it is Priya Ramani or Wahab, then it would have been for the accused to defend himself. Now here, see, the legal system is such that the, uh, the, you know, the complainants have made the complaint they have, but Akbar can slap them. So globalization will also lead to a discourse mm. and dialogue on jurisprudence, on legal systems. And remember, legal systems are not cast in so stone. So Indian laws, therefore, will make the shift definitely towards incorporating the complaints of women, including harassment of the workplace, of which you've so aptly cited the, the statistics. Do you feel that workspaces, be it the media, be it the IT industry, there are, there are about 588 sexual harassment complaints from India's companies, 244 from IT companies. Do you think these figures show that sexual harassment complaints and Vishakha guidelines have not been taken seriously? And does the Congress have any right to make this a political issue? They're saying we've sacked our NSUI president on the back of sexual harassment allegations. MJ Akbar must go as well. I think the complaints you're seeing are the tip of the iceberg, and clearly there are mechanisms in place for people to do it. But I look at this very positively, which is that MJ Akbar will never, ever work in a newsroom, no matter what, I hope. And I think that's a positive development. There are other journalists that have been named who I hope will, over time, uh, not work in newsrooms where they have caused so much hurt and so much damage to women. Again, I am not interested in politicizing this simply because I think if you look at a 20, 30 year period, um, every party has been in power or not and what they have done or not. But I think we should really focus on can there be systemic changes? Thank you very much, all of you, for joining us on this debate.